Before we moved here to Iowa, many of you know we lived in Florida. So we moved here from Florida a few years ago. And when we lived in Florida, I, I was a pastor at a church, and I would commute every day to church on my bike. And uh, so this was something that I did a lot when we were in Florida. I haven't done much here, but, but so I would get up every morning, take, get on my bike and ride, ride to church. Now, certain times of the year, when I went to start my ride, it was dark out. And so I had this, this headlight, this flashlight that was on my bike, and it was rechargeable. And so I would charge it beforehand and make sure everything was okay. But there were a few times where something went wrong. Um, maybe the, the, the light wasn't connected properly. Maybe for whatever reason, it, did, it didn't charge like I thought it would. So I'm riding in the dark, and all of a sudden, I can, I can see the light is just getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And I know I don't have much more time before the flashlight is out completely. And this happened to me a few times where I was riding in the dark and my, and my light died. Now, I had a few options here. I could have done the safe thing and gotten off my bike and walked the rest of the way. But I was young and stupid, so... I, in those instances, I decided to continue riding in the dark. And it was kind of scary. Because most of the time, I couldn't see the bike path that I was riding on. I mean, it was hard to tell where it was. And if I would ride off the bike path, I would crash and get hurt, and maybe hurt my bike. You know, so so it was it was a little scary. Also, one of the things that happened very often in Florida was as I would ride to work and back, I would see all kinds of animals. One of the main animals I saw were wild hogs. They were all over the place. And so as I was riding, there were a number of mornings where there was a wild hog standing right on the bike path. And we kind of had a showdown to see who would flinch first. And eventually he moved out of the way. So, but if I couldn't see the hog while I was, while I was riding my bike, that could have been pretty bad news. Um, there were times there were snakes on the path. Twice there were alligators on the bike path. They were little ones, but they were still alligators, so they scared me pretty bad. But, but without a light, I couldn't see where I was going. Without that light, I couldn't see if there were critters or anything else in my way. Now, I was lucky and never crashed when that happened. I was lucky that I didn't hit something when this happened. But it was a frightening experience. One of the things that we're going to see throughout the Gospel of John, or 1 John, or the, sorry, the Epistle of 1 John, is there is this contrast between light and darkness. And one of the things that John wants us to know as we read this book is that as children of God, we need to walk in the light. As children of God, we need to know that there is light and dark. And we if we choose to follow Jesus, if we um, are a child of God, we must walk in the light. And we can't have it both ways. We, we can't um, go to the darkness or fellowship with the darkness. If we are a child of God, light will overcome darkness. So let's look at 1 John Chapter 1, verse 5. Last week, we started this study in 1 John, and we saw how John was, was emphasizing over and over how he was proclaiming what he saw, what he touched, what he heard. Remember, he was combating that false teaching that claimed that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And, G and John is very concerned about pointing out that, yes, Jesus was real. He, he, John touched him. John heard his words. And now John was proclaiming it to everyone else. 
And, and we saw the purpose that John was writing was so that there would, they would walk in fellowship. And that hit our joy, John's joy, the joy of the, the believers would be complete. And so now we're going to see, as we go on in this chapter, some of the, the steps necessary for those things to be true. And we're going to see today what it means to walk in the light. And we're going to see the benefits for believers to walk in the light. Let's look at 1 John 1, verse 5. John says, This is the message that we heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So as John begins this section, he points our attention to God, to God the Father. And he wants us to know that God is light. His character, his essence is one of light. There is no darkness in him at all. And it's important for us to understand this as John begins this section that light is describes God, that light comes from God, that light is who God is, it describes His character. It describes His being. Now, as we think of that, we have to ask ourselves, okay, well then, what does light mean? I mean, we all understand the difference between light and darkness in, in the physical world. But John here is talking about more than just when the sun is out or when the, the sun is down. When he says God is light, I think John helps us understand in some of his other writings. If we go to the Gospel of John in John 1.1, 1, 1, he, he talks about how the word Jesus was light. And in him, or <clears throat> in him was light, and the light was the life. I'm sorry, in him was life, and the life was the light of man. He describes light and life together in one idea. That light describes or has something to do with, with this life. That in God there is life. In God, there is this idea where we live and breathe and find our being, find ourself in Him. Not only that, but also light is also, when contrasted with darkness, symbolizes God's holiness. That God is the one who is holy and righteous, and in Him we find the way. In Him we find the source of everything that we need to live spiritually. It also, as we look at this, we understand that in him is no darkness. There is no sin. There is no evil. There is no death in God. God is life. God is holy. God is, is everything that we desire is found in him. So as we begin this section, John wants to remind us who we worship. God wants to remind, or John wants to remind us whose side we're on if we're Christians. Because in verse 6, after he tells us who God is and describes God as light, look at verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. So if God is light. And we walk in darkness. There's a problem. Something isn't right. We can't say that we have fellowship with God. If we walk in darkness. Now as we start this. I think we need to understand. And I think sometimes Christians kind of allow some of these passages to, 
to, um, to cause guilt because we all sin, right? So when it says walk in darkness, I don't think this is describing a sin because if that was the case, then this would describe every single one of us, right? I think what we're going to see is that that there is provisions made for us when we sin. We're going to see that later on in the passage. So I don't think when he says walking in darkness, I don't think he's saying that that time where you sin, you know, that that you sin once and all of a sudden you're walking in darkness. I think this is a descriptive description of a life that instead of choosing to follow God, choosing to walk in the light, instead chooses darkness, which represents sin, which represents unrighteousness, which represents death. And we're going to see throughout this book that John describes how we can tell the difference between walking in light and walking in darkness. So we need to be a little patient because patient, we're going to see that more and more throughout this book. One of the things John often talks about is love and how love is a description of how the Christian walks in life. That if we don't love, that shows us that we're not walking in the light. We're going to see other things as well. But what John wants us to know is that we can't walk in darkness and say we have fellowship with Jesus. I think in some ways, some of the things that I've already mentioned can be descriptive of walking in darkness. Um, living without love, that's one thing. Um, another thing is following false teaching, false theology, heretical things. John mentions that later. He talks about how the spirit of the Antichrist, who says Jesus didn't come in the flesh, that, that is false, heretical teaching. And John is saying, if you follow that teaching, you don't have fellowship with the Father because that's not the true gospel. Right? So walking in darkness could mean believing false things, believing things that are contrary to the gospel. It can also mean living in such a way that is contrary to the gospel. And we all know there's many different things that fall under that category. And we know that we, in some ways, all fall short. But when we fall short, what do we do? When we fall short, how do we act? We're going to see here that that goes a long way to see whether we're walking in darkness or not. If we stay, we have fellowship, yet walk in darkness, we lie. Look at verse 7. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And it's interesting, fellowship was a, was a key part of, of last, last week as we looked at the opening. How one of the reasons John was writing this book was so that those who read it would have fellowship with, with one another and fellowship with the Father. That idea of fellowship we talked about represented a, a oneness, a unity, a, a togetherness of community. How it it described it was the word that described the early church in Acts chapter two when they were together and shared everything they had and they had common purpose, common goal. That that's the same idea that John is talking about here. That fellowship is so important. And just as he said, that was one of the reasons he wrote in this in these verses. We see it is the first benefit of walking in the light. The first benefit is fellowship. We have fellowship with one another, with the body, with Christ's church. That when we walk in the light, when we walk in the light with Jesus, Jesus is in the light when we follow him. I think that is the idea of walking in the light. It says God is light. Jesus is in the light. So for us to walk in the light means we are following Jesus. It means we are a disciple of Jesus. It means we have taken up our cross and followed Jesus. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean we always do everything right. It means we are disciples and we are following our master. 
And when we do that, we don't do it alone. Because in this passage, just like last week, it describes fellowship with one another means the body. We have fellowship with every other person who is a believer and follower of Jesus. Now, we think of the body of Christ sometimes in very small, small ways. We think of it as a local congregation. We think of it as this group of people sometimes, which it is, right? This local body fellowships, helps, encourages. We're here for each other. And, and when we walk with Jesus, one of the great benefits of following Jesus is we have this body, this group, so we're not alone. But the body is more than just this local congregation. The body of Christ is the church down the street and the church across town and the church on the other side of the state. And the church on the other side of the world, every single person who trusts in Jesus is a part of the body of Christ. And although we are not connected as maybe we should be to other churches around us, we're not necessarily connected to other churches around the world like we should be, like we could be. We're all here for each other. And one of the things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians is the body needs each other. And you, one part of the body can't say, I don't need you. But it also says the body rejoices together. The body mourns together. The body is there for each other. When we walk in the light, we have fellowship with a vast number of fellow disciples. And maybe you've had this experience where maybe you're out of town traveling somewhere and you meet someone and they're also a believer. Have you ever had that experience? It's kind of a cool thing, isn't it? You go somewhere new, you don't know anybody, maybe you're sharing a, a row on a plane with somebody or, or you run into someone somewhere and you get talking and you find out they're a believer and even though you're far from home, you feel a connectedness with this person that you've never met before. One of the things about the body of Christ is that it connects people of different races, different cultures, different financial status, different all these differences that separate us in this earth. All of these things that cause people to to divide the body of Christ is able to bring together. One of the things that I loved about one of the churches I attended when I was in college, um, it was in New York and it was the most uh, ethnically diverse church that I've ever attended. As, as someone who was white, I was a minority in the church. It, it was great. Because when we would look out on the congregation, there would, there would be nothing that would bring that group of people together, right? Uh, we had so many differences. We didn't eat the same food. Many didn't speak the same language. They, they spoke English, but they had their native language that was different than everybody else's. They were so different. But the one thing that united that small group of people together was Jesus. And it didn't matter whether they were Chinese, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Filipino, what brought them together was Jesus. And when we think of the body of Christ, sometimes we forget that the body of Christ is, is an amazing gift that God has given to all of his followers. And sometimes we don't appreciate what it means to be in fellowship with this, with this group, this wonderful group that... When we have weakness, one of the things about the body of Christ is when we have need, other parts of the body of Christ can meet that need and supply for that need. When we have shortcomings where we don't, aren't able to meet the things that come in our life, there are others around us who are there to help. And John says, 
when we walk in the light, we have fellowship with this body. And that is a blessing that we don't appreciate most of the time. I think about the early church during John's day. And we don't understand how difficult they had it. We can't, most of us can't even begin to grasp what it would be like to be persecuted for our faith. What it would be like to be sent to prison simply for being a Christian. Under the reign of Nero, being persecuted and tortured and killed simply for being a Christian. You have to remember that in the early days of the church, there were small churches that were spread throughout great distances. And, and they didn't have the internet. They, didn't, they weren't able to communicate like we could. There was, they were separated many times by miles and distance and language. But yet we see, especially in the book of Acts, that the church was there for each other. When Jerusalem, when the church in Jerusalem was under persecution, the churches in Asia Minor got rallied together and sent money and gifts to help the church in Jerusalem because they were one body. And in our time and in our world, we live in a divided body where we are separated by denominations we are separated by philosophies. We are separated sometimes by silly things like what Bible translation you use. But when we strip away all of that, we truly are one body. John says, when you walk in the light, you have fellowship with one another. And the rest of the verse says, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not only do we have the benefit of fellowship, but we walk as people who are forgiven. We walk as people whose sins are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ we are able to experience the joy of having our sins forgiven. We don't have to dread and fear the wrath and judgment of God anymore. When we walk in the light, we don't have to fear some of those passages we see in the Old Testament and in the New of God's judgment when some of those passages of God's judgment are, are scary. They're terrifying. When we see the wrath of a holy, righteous God. But as a child of God, because our sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ, we are free from that fear of wrath and judgment. To walk in the light means we have fellowship. To walk in the light means the blood of Christ cleanses us from our sin. And I don't want to get this misunderstood. I am not saying that we earn our salvation. We earn forgiveness by walking in the light. I think what John is trying to show us is walking in the light is indicative of someone who has been saved, who is a disciple, who is following. And the person who is a disciple is one who has placed their trust in Jesus. The Bible is clear that we are saved not by our works, but by the work of Jesus on the cross for our sins. The Bible tells us Jesus being holy and righteous and without sin took the punishment of sin on himself when he died on the cross and his blood that was shed cleanses us if we place our trust in him. It cleanses us from our sins. So when we follow Jesus as his disciple, when we place our faith in him, we are forgiven. And that's why it makes no sense for the follower of Jesus, the disciple of Jesus, to walk in darkness.
Why would someone whose sins are forgiven, who has fellowship with this body, who has been given all of the wonderful blessings of salvation, why would they walk in death? Why would they walk in darkness? And that's the struggle every Christian has. Who are we going to follow? And although we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, although we, we are forgiven, we sometimes struggle with sin. And when we do, we have forgiveness. Let's look on in verse 8. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You know, some, I think John is trying, is kind of responding to those people who say, well, I don't need to be forgiven, right? <laughs> he just said Jesus will cleanse us from all our sin. But there are people, right, who don't think they have anything to be forgiven of. There are people who think that they are good enough. I've spoken to many people throughout my life who have told me that they are a good person, and so they know that they'll go to heaven when they die because they're good. And when you ask them what's your definition of good, you know, that can change depending on who you ask. But most of the time is, you know, I, I do good things. You know, I haven't done anything really bad. I do more good than bad, so I'm okay. Or sometimes they point to other people and say, well, I'm not as bad as this person. I've never killed anybody. I've never, you know, I've never done anything uh, horrific like that. And so there is this attitude among people that that we don't need God's forgiveness. We don't need the blood of Jesus. And that shows itself in, in a number of different ways. Some of them we've mentioned already, people who are just flat out, I don't need it. Or it can be exemplified in people who just reject the gospel. You know, you share them the gospel and they're like, no, I don't need that, right? It's kind of the same thing, right? They're saying, I, I don't need that. And John is saying, if you say you have no sin, you are deceived, one of the things about coming to Christ is acknowledging our sin. That's, that's the first part of the gospel is that we are sinners. That is the starting point for us to acknowledge that before a holy, righteous God, we are guilty and we are sinners. That is the first part of the gospel. And John is saying, this is where you start. You can't say, I don't need that. You can't say, I haven't done anything wrong. If you say that, you are a liar. And verse 9, one of the famous verses of Scripture, one of those verses I remember memorizing as a small child in Awana. This verse says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This kind of goes together with what we saw in the last section, but the second benefit of walking in the light is forgiveness. Forgiveness. In this, these particular verses, we see that forgiveness, first of all, requires honesty. We have to be honest with ourselves and honest with God. We can't justify our sin. We can't try to overlook our sin. We can't make excuses for our sins. If we truly seek God's forgiveness, it begins by honestly coming to him. And confessing that we are sinners. That we have failed. And part of walking in the light is confessing when we mess up, right? 
because we're all going to mess up. So what do we do when we sin? What do we do when we fail? We don't linger in that darkness. We don't continue in that darkness. We go to the Lord and confess our sins because when we confess, this verse tells us that God, I love this part, God is faithful. Why is it important that God is faithful in the forgiveness of our sins? Because he said he would, right? So if you go to him and you say, Lord, I'm sorry I did this, and he said, I'm not going to forgive you. I mean, could you imagine a God like that? Could you imagine, you know, you, God said, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to forgive you of your sin. And then you go and ask and seek forgiveness. And he says, no. A God like that is not a faithful God. Here, the John is saying, God will be true to his word. You can count on it. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to question it because we do, right? We seek God's forgiveness, and because of our guilt, we sometimes wonder whether God has really forgiven us. We allow that guilt to, to dig deep in our hearts, and we feel like God hasn't forgiven us. But verses like this remind us, God is faithful. He will do what he said, and he's just, which is really interesting because... God, if God is just and God in his justice, we deserve death because of our sin, right? So how is God just in forgiving us? Well, he's just because he doesn't simply overlook our sins. He's just because Jesus paid the price for our sins with his blood. So when we go to God, and confess and acknowledge. This tells us God is faithful to his word and he's just because the price has been paid in full by his son, Jesus. And when we seek him and when we confess, he will forgive us and cleanse us. That picture here is a beautiful picture, right? Because we come to God dirty, rotten. We come to God broken. Because sin is not, I mean, we know our world glorifies sin. We see it all over the place where, where it's made to look good. It, it seems wonderful and fun, but we know in truth that sin is dirty and gross and painful. And when we come to God, it's not as if God just says, okay, you're forgiven, now get out of here. No, he says, God forgives us and cleanses us. It's as if God takes us and washes the layers of sin off of us so that we're whole again, so that we're clean so that we no longer have to bear that dirt and that, that, that stain of sin in our lives. That in God's eyes, we are forgiven. We are made whole. We are clean. When we understand the blessings of walking in the light, John wants to show us that walking in the light is what God desires for all of us, but also it's what we all need. It is what we need in our lives. It's what we're looking for in our lives. We constantly look for these things in, in ways that can never fully satisfy. And that's what the world does all the time. They're looking for community and fellowship. They're looking for hope and wholeness. They're looking for forgiveness. And they're looking for all of these things, but they're looking in the wrong places. But when we walk in the light, We have fellowship. We have forgiveness. We're cleansed from all our unrighteousness. Verse 10, just to finish off this section, says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. 
and his word is not in us. I think we can see very clearly walking in the light involves acknowledging our sin. John is clear in these verses. You can't say you have no sin and walk in the light. You can't say you haven't sinned because his word is not in you if you say that. So instead of, instead of walking in the light, meaning that we are all perfect and we do everything right, what this shows us is part of walking in the light is acknowledging we're all sinners. Acknowledging our failures, acknowledging our shortcomings, coming to God and asking for forgiveness. That's part of what it means to walk in the light. And that's something all of us can do. I just want to encourage you today. If you're struggling, if you're struggling with sin, first of all, you're not alone. We all do. I just want to encourage you. You don't need my forgiveness or anyone else's forgiveness. You need God's forgiveness. And he has promised you he will forgive you and make you whole. So don't delay. Don't allow guilt to put it off. Seek him. Because he will forgive. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful and just. Lord, we thank you that you have provided a way for us to know you. You have provided a way for us to be forgiven. And Lord, I just, I just lift up everyone here as we struggle with sin in our lives. Lord, help us to seek your forgiveness. Keep us from overwhelming guilt, debilitating guilt. Help us to know that we are forgiven. And if we feel as if we're not, transform our, our hearts and our minds so that we know the truth that because of the blood of Jesus, we are forgiven. The debt is paid in full. Help us, Lord, to walk in the light. In your name, amen. Let's stand.